think kids would feel uncomfortable with it if you're next to it? I don't think it's okay to show women like that because, um, it's private. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Mesley. I'm anchor of the National, or at least for now, until the new show comes along <laughs> in a couple of months, uh, and also of the National. Um, it's a real pleasure to see you. I don't get to see people when I read the news at night. I sort of imagine there's people there. So nice to see everybody, and so you've all got clothes on. Um, <laughs> don't want to imagine what everyone's doing late at night. Anyway, I am absolutely thrilled to be part of this, and I have just met most, well, actually everybody, even uh, Sophie we haven't met before. So, yeah, so here we are, and I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce four women who have had major roles in trying to flip the script and the way that we're seen and the images that are presented to women. So I'm going to introduce you now. Next to me, starting next to me, is Carolyn Tasted. She is one of the most powerful women in corporate America. <laughs> She's group Take president. It. Why are you <laughs> giggling? <Take it. laughs> this is good. Yes. Uh -huh. She's group president. Yes, that's good. <laughs> yes. Great. Well, there's so many now, it's really not an issue. Um, she's group president North America of Procter & Gamble, which as the world's largest advertiser, wields tremendous power in how girls and women are portrayed in ads that we see every day. Sophie Gregoire Trudeau is a vocal ad advocate for gender equality. She's been lending her voice to these issues, including self-esteem, gender empowerment, and issues related to women and children, and has a rather high-profile stance to do that from now. So uh, welcome, Sophie. Madonna Badger is, uh, we can applaud for everybody at the end. She founded the powerhouse ad agency Badgers and Winters. She's personally thrown down the challenge to the ad agency, uh, the ad industry, to stop showing women as a collection of body parts. Uh, and last but not least, Roseanne Supernault. She is an actress and an activist, and she speaks out on behalf of both women and Indigenous people. And they don't all live here now, but I should point out that this is an all-Canadian panel. Carolyn, you grew up in Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan, small town. Montreal. Montreal. Uh, Newfoundland. Newfoundland, yeah, and uh, and Roseanne Edmonton. is in Alberta. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so the f the uh, switch has been somewhat switched in my world. Uh, thank goodness. When I first started out a thousand years ago, uh, the line was that there weren't any women other than Barbara Walters uh, reading the news. I'm Barbara from. Um, because women's voices just weren't authoritative enough. To nice people said this, like nice people said this, <laughs> with straight faces. <laughs> and the reasoning was that, I guess, that of course women's voices weren't authoritative if you never heard them reading the news. So things have changed a lot over the years. And um, I'm going to start with you, Carolyn, on how much things are changing in the ad industry. Um, obviously, advertising a has a huge influence on our culture about how girls feel about themselves and the products that we buy. P&G spends seven billion dollars, seven billion dollars a year on marketing and advertising. So it's in a pretty powerful position to sort of change, affect those those images. Uh, you did a campaign recently about girls and self-confidence. Why mm -hmm. why that issue? Well, as you say, P&G is a company of brands. Uh, brands are really the heart of our business, and they all have their own character, their own personality, uh, their own voice. Uh, but as the world's largest advertiser, we have an opportunity to use that voice to have a significant impact. And our Always brand, uh, which is a feminine protection brand, uh, has uh, stood out for many years uh, in helping young girls feel more confident. That's so really women's, women's confidence, that used to be, like, I remember the ads of the <laughs> so running across, <laughs> you never even talked about, so we're getting, things have changed. Things have changed. We're really working to make it real, less floaty, 
uh, and, uh, and really stand for helping these young girls. And uh, always three years ago, came out with a campaign called Like a Girl. And the phrase, like a girl, as everybody understands, meant uh, negative things. It had negative connotations, or it was thrown around very commonly as an insult uh, by boys, but also by girls. And mm -hmm. as we looked at that, uh, people didn't even understand the inherent bias within that. And that's what the Always team set out to change with their Like a Girl campaign. Uh, and we are now in our fourth year, and we've just launched a campaign on uh, the fear of failure, which we heard some people talk about today. And as we've diagnosed, uh, you know, we know that girls, 50% of young girls as they're going through puberty, experience this big drop in confidence. That's why I always wants to, to really help girls be more confident and feel more confident. Mm -hmm. And that drop in confidence often comes uh, with the onset of their first period. And as we've continued to look at this in the four years we've been running this campaign, uh, we've now also discovered that 50% uh, of young girls uh, are really paralyzed by this fear of failure. 70% uh, of them don't want to try anything new just in case, just in case it doesn't go as well as they expect it to. And there's huge societal pressure that we all understand. About 80% of girls feel that societal pressure to be perfect. And so that more really... More than boys. More than boys. Wow. And that, the, all of that's rooted in bias, but it really holds, has potential to hold girls back. And what we also understand is when you actually work through that, as you actually get through those pieces, you build such resilience and such confidence that takes you not just through your teen years, but certainly into your adult years. So that's the impetus and the motivation behind the campaign. So, no surprise, we have that ad. We really want you to see about what the, a surprise. The, the challenge to uh, <laughs> think beyond the sort of, the, yes. to look at failure for what it is. So uh, let's, let's take a look. Keep going like a girl. Let's take a look. Failure, the one thing we all experience. We failed at many things we will fail at many more. And that's a good thing, because failures aren't setbacks. Failures are fuel to keep going and keep growing. So what impact does that have? It's, is the message getting through? Well, this ad and this campaign has really just started, but certainly three years ago as we started this work, uh, when we talked to young girls, and we talked to young girls a lot to understand how they think and how they feel and watch how they behave, and when we started this campaign, uh, more than 80% of young girls thought that phrase, like a girl, meant something negative. 19% hmm. uh, said, oh, I think it can be a little bit positive. Today, when we poll young girls, 76% uh, think the word and the phrase, like a girl, means something positive, empowering, and it becomes, uh, as you can see in the picture, anthems and, and slogans and, and titles that they use all around, and, and we're really excited about that. And we're hoping we have the same impact with this uh, current video campaign. Uh, because uh, this notion of the fear of failure, again, if we can, I think everybody can remember that time when they were young where there was something that seemed so daunting that you couldn't quite get through, and whether it was a parent or a teacher, a coach, uh, a friend, somebody who said, no, I think you can really do this, and you persevered, and whether it took you one, two, three, or you know, a number of times, uh, when you get through it, the resilience you, you feel, the confidence that you garner from that is really tremendous, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish here. And then I, I have to say, uh, these campaigns build business. So they're doing great things and having great impact for society, for girls, uh, and they build a great brand and they build a great business. So that magical combination is what really works. Hmm. Sophie, you've worked in advertising. Um, have, you've yeah. championed issues of, of uh, self-esteem. What do you tell young girls these days? It's more about what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> As someone who's, who's uh, suffered from eating disorders when I, was a, when I was younger, and somebody who has healed from it, um, when you compare, you shouldn't compare eras, but you do see more today that girls are more exposed to pressure in different ways. Social media is great, but it doesn't help. Uh, you know, these, I would say, 
subtle violence that you find in a lot of things that we consume, TV shows, radio shows, uh, comments on social media. It's kind of what's become normal sometimes, and normal is the hardest thing to change in a society. Well, I say, let's redefine what normal is. Because if we had to, when you say, you know, like a girl, what would we say if we asked people, what does like a boy mean today? Right. Because we have fought so hard and we are continuing to fight to make sure that half of the world's population is not only given their human, basic human rights, but also blooming and becoming engaged citizens. Because the price of hurting the womb of humanity, girls and women, is a high price to pay for everybody, including men. And not only is it to everyone's detriment, but it's also an insult to the capacity of masculinity. Um, boys are able to become wise, strong, rooted, open-minded and open-hearted individuals. But we live in a culture that not only objectifies and, you know, makes violence and pornography and objectification of women's bodies, for example, something normal, that in the end, men are losing at this as well because it takes away from their full potential. Um, I'd like to know how many people here, do we, have, do we have any artists in the room? Any artists here? Couple, one, two, <laughs> three, four. All right, four artists. Lucky us. How many are artistic? Artistic, any? See, more people? Not half the room. So I married a former teacher. And really? I did. <laughs> and it's really like his true nature. Like, and he tells me that he used to ask kindergarten students, who's an artist in the room? 99% of the little boys and girls would raise their hands. And then you ask high school, yeah, maybe half. You ask adults, wow. Nobody almost raises their hands unless it's your job. Human beings are meant to be creative creatures. As our bodies allow us, whether you have children or not, to be creative and to bear a life, to give life, we are creative beings in the true nature of who we are. Now, when we live in a society that teaches us to be anything else but our true self, creative, blooming, courageous, steadfast, fearless, protecting, nurturing, opened. Human beings are meant to come on this earth to express. But when you live in fear, because when you are taught to self-hate, not believe in who you are, think that where you come from is lower than anybody, anybody else, and of course, as a mm -hmm. mom, you know, I live every day not thinking that I'm different than anybody else. I don't really care for titles, and, but I care for responsibility. And depending where you are in your life, to take responsibility, and if you have a voice, to be able to use it responsibly. But to live in fear, and this is what so many millions and millions of people across the globe, especially girls, live in fear. Fear takes away your creativity. And when you take away creativity from a population, women across the globe, you take away the notion of progress. Because you take the inherent nat nature of a human being away, then what does it mean to evolve as a society? Our notion of progress celebrating 150 years of confederation, right here, right now. We ask ourselves, where are we going? Doesn't matter what political colors you wear. What matters is, knowing that as many people as possible, if not all, participate in their own blooming, in their own potential to become. So when I see so many girls suffer, when I see so many boys suffer too through that, you know, I was sitting around with a, girl, a group of young people, and I asked them, how many of you, and it was girls and boys, and I asked them, how many of you have mentors in your life that you can confide in, that can you, be, you can be really be honest with? Like, the fact that your boyfriend watches porn all the time and that doesn't feel normal to you and it hurts you, talk about it. We know so well what is wrong and what is right 
deep within, but we've learned to not trust our instincts anymore through the culture that we live in. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge price to pay. And when I do ask them, so who has somebody that they can talk to? Most of the girls will raise their hands because women together, we build our self-esteem in our teenage years, usually and mostly in our capacity to build sane, healthy, intimate relationships with other women, mostly. And then, of course, with boys or girls, whatever <laughs> your preferences. And boys still do very much build their self-esteem, and this is not me, this is studies that you know, have, been, have shown evidence. Boys still build their self-esteem more on sports and competition and, you know, thriving to be courageous and kind of like a hero's journey. I'm going to come back to you on that. Maybe hold Please off do. on, yeah, on the, the male aspect of that because I think we want to talk about that too. But I'm just going to quickly move on to uh, Roseanne. So you're a film and television actor, actress. Yes. Um, Sophie was talking about the importance of mentors and you are a mentor, but you're also mm -hmm. in this industry where there's so much importance put on physical appearance and what your image has to be in, as, a, as an actress. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you dictate your self-image in all of that? How do you not let it dictate your self-image? Well, I think for me, it's that I come from an incredible group of people. I am a Métis Cree woman from the East Prairie Métis Settlement in Northern Alberta, which is part of a federation of uh, Métis settlements in Alberta. There's eight in total. And ever since I was very young, I've had a very strong sense of identity and a very strong sense of who I am and where I come from. Uh, I actually come from a very unique group of people because as you know, indigenous people cannot be grouped into one. You can't make all First Nations one First Nations. You cannot, or one First Nation, you cannot make all Métis people one Métis. And I come from a group of Métis people that were Métis before Louis Riel's time. And most people are surprised to hear about something like that. So in my community and where I come from, I've always felt this really strong sense of being grounded and we are the only Métis people on the planet who are land-based, who actually have land. We are, we are self-funded, we are independent and I feel like, I feel a very strong connection to my land. I feel a very strong connection to my family who I see as survivors. My grandmother is a survivor of residential school. She went to residential school for 10 years and any time that I am going through something as an actress or as a storyteller where I feel, and I go through it, it's a very tough industry. It's very true. You have to have thick skin and I go through a lot and when I go through that, I go back home and I put my feet on the land and I put my feet on the soil and I hold my grandmother's hand and I play Scrabble with her. <laughs> she so lets yes. me win sometimes. <laughs> so and it sounds like you have more issues to worry about than advertising <laughs> images. But, but, but the pressure, what do you think of the, the images that are presented in advertising today and the pressures that you feel and, and that you talk about with, with the people that you mentor and you're, because you're, you run workshops for young indigenous men and women, right? Absolutely. Well, what I mean to say is that I feel like my confidence comes from somewhere inside and that when I look in the mirror or even when I'm performing as an artist, when I'm performing right now, I'm genuinely not concerned about what my body looks like right now, but I had to work so hard as a person in order to get to a place where I wasn't being affected by that. And I used to struggle. I had a borderline eating disorder when I was a young, when I was a teenager, and that 100% was coming from the pressure that I felt as an actress to be thin, and that I still feel to this day. I regularly get told in my discipline to lose weight. Hmm. I get, I, I've, I constructed this idea as a young woman in the industry as a young girl, because I've been doing this since I was 13 years old, that in order for me to be successful as a, a female storyteller, I had to be slim and I had to be skinny. And it took me years to own this and, and to love it. And I love, I love it now. I love myself and I love my body now. So, Madonna, I'm gonna move on to you. You've, you've been fighting against this or been trying to tackle this in the advertising industry. What, was there an aha moment for you? Um, there was. I, um, I've had my own advertising agency for 25 years. And before I started that agency, um, I actually did the Marky Mark and Kate Moss campaigns. 
And um, so I made Kate Moss skinnier um, and retouching. <laughs> How did that? And, um, you know, I, in other words, I was a culprit. And um, for many years, and I didn't understand the harm that I was causing. Mm -hmm. um, and so a few years ago, um, we were doing a uh, ad for a ten billion dollar, you know, beauty company in the U.S. Well, globally, and we had this premise um, that you know, would you? How does red lipstick make you feel? And all of these women said, oh, it feels great, I love it, it makes me feel like I can, you know, do anything, I can take on my day. And we said, oh, great, okay, perfect. So, would you wear red lipstick to ask for a raise? And they all said, oh, no, I would <laughs> never do that. I would that's never want to push my femininity in anyone else's face. And so that's a real conundrum. It makes no sense, right? So we started digging into the research, and most of it at that point was academic. And the academic research showed that one in four um, little girls um, have been on a diet in the U.S. by the age of seven. And that's eight, 75 to 80 percent of 11-year-old little girls um, would rather get cancer than be fat. Wow. And so, um, so you did something. You you released a video and anonymously so this, on on YouTube. Yes. So the, all I'll I'll wrap this up quickly. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of. Anyway. So what happened is that um, we decided to do something about it, and it, to use your words, and <laughs> um, we made a film, and I believe we have the film here. Let's take a look. What is a thigh gap? When you're standing straight up, there's like a gap in between your thighs. Girls just don't want their thighs to touch. No. The Kylie Jenner challenge has gone viral. Doctors warn it can cause a number of issues. Oh my god. Oh my god. We raise our little girls to view their bodies as projects to constantly be improved. Advertising often trivializes battering, sexual assault, and even murder. I just think that it's harming women psychologically, physically, mentally, socially. I love giving blowjobs to sandwiches. I hope when my daughter grows up that she has friends just like these. The key to my heart? A man that smells like a vagina. I'd sell my body for a burger. It's pretty shocking, actually, to see to see that we're we're whipping through the time here. So I get, just tell us the impact uh, that that's uh, had. End result: um, we have about 45 million views. Um, we have reached over 175 different countries, all with a budget of about 5,000 yes. bucks. Um, wow. So that's good news. The other good news is that um, at Cannes. Um, is the Can Lions, and that's like every advertising agency's dream, you know, is to get a gold lion. And so I went and gave a talk there about what the hell it is that we were doing by objectifying women as parts, as props, as overly retouched, unachievable beings. And then the next year I came back, and the jury packet, um, they let me help change. And so it now says that objectification of women, stereotyping, et cetera, hurts all of us. And the true judge is empathy. If it were your mother, if it were your sister, how would it make you feel? Um, and so that's the good news. So Roseanne, you were you were raised by your dad. He got you into sports. We saw a lot of jokes about the throw like a girl, um, but sports helped you. You weren't enfeebled by that. Absolutely, I would tell anyone who listens to put your daughter into your children into sports and martial arts. I grew up doing taekwondo, basketball, volleyball. I played provincial handball. Anything where you need to like score a goal, I was in there doing it. And uh, yes, I was a tomboy growing up and. 
I, I, I was chubby, didn't shave my legs, didn't pluck my eyebrows, wore my brother's hand-me-downs, and I was the girl who gave <laughs> boys my friends' as numbers. They were like, oh, your friend's cute. Can we talk to her? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I played a lot of sports for sure, and in fact, um, my, my dad taught me how to hunt and how to trap and, and when I was younger, and it, it did. It gave me a very solid sense of confidence to know that uh, in spite of anything that I might be going, uh, going through outside the court or off the court, I knew that I could dominate on the court, and there's just a sort of swagger that that gives you, even from a young age. And yes, I, I, I love that I grew up in sports. Can I add something very quickly? Uh, so I'm a spokesperson for Fit Spirit, which encourages young girls who one out of two uh, Canadian girls out of teenage, year, teenage mm -hmm. years will quit sports. I was raised extremely active, almost extremely. <laughs> um, and uh, the impact that it ha has on your mental health to be able to experience life with your body, to know its limits, mm -hmm. mind, body, and heart, is a gift. And doing sports is not just doing sports, it's about testing who you are with the mm -hmm. elements, with, and doing it in yeah. nature is even better. So we have a problem here in our own country with uh, young Canadian girls not practicing sports enough, so it's so important that you raise your voice on this matter, so thank you for doing that. Thank you, thank you very much. So I'm gonna come back to you for some deep thoughts, well to everybody if we have time, but there's, there's one more thing that I wanna make sure that everybody gets to see, uh, and it's something that uh, Madonna, that you've prepared for us. It's, it's a, it shows that there has been some progress. This, so this is, or maybe not progress. No progress. We'll see in a moment. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but why don't you talk through a couple of uh, pictures here. These are uh, old, old slides. Yes, vintage. How things new. used to yeah. look. Uh, the the um, ad on the, well, anyway, the new Good ad luck. is three years and the old ad is vintage. But if you could just roll through all of them really quickly, the important thing is that you know, we, we wanted to get our own research, right? We didn't want it to just be college. Um, that coffee me, one, I'd love to, that, that's unbelievable. That and so this Stuart, of this like, Stuart oh, Weitzman so ad, we tested to see how women felt in a quantitative test. If 100 is normal, this ad tested negative 260 <laughs> for brand reputation, which means that I threw all my Stuart Weitzman huh. out <laughs> of my closet and gave them away. And in that negative 260, I bet you a lot of other women did too. But it just is astonishing to me the laziness of selling, of trying to sell mm -hmm. shoes with three of the most powerful super women in the world and cigarettes with another na naked woman from the 50s and how so little has changed. Yeah, that shot of the woman kneeling by her husband, serving him coffee and making a man's... Uh, like, I know what I'd do with that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really warm. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, Carolyn, are we, are we getting anywhere? Where are we? <laughs> Madonna has done such great work in this area. I, I, think, um, I think there are more people focused on this. I think from an advertising okay. standpoint, I think the work that Donna, Madonna did in Cannes to change the jury criteria has made a big difference. And so what we're focused on, I mean, we really believe in what your wonderful husband said this morning, we believe there is a better world out there. There's a better world for all of us if we can find a way to get rid of the gender bias and find a way to give uh, equal voice and equal representation of women and men. And we are committed to use our voice in advertising to do that. And when some of our best campaigns reach tens of millions of people, uh, and so if we can have an impact with that that can spark a conversation, it's, it's really just about sparking the conversation, creating some dialogue, because when we make gender bias visible, we have a chance to change yeah. it. And that's what we're very, very committed to doing, working very closely with Ma Madonna and her team uh, to continue to move that forward. And we know that when we do that, it'll build the business. It, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing when you bring it all together. Sophie mentioned er earlier the effects of, of porn. It's not just the advertising, it's sort of the, the men's I, male idea. Of what, what, do you think things are getting better or worse? When you look online, you see some of these ads. Like, I, th I thought those things were in the past, but in some ways, they seem to be getting worse. What, what's your sense as a young person? And then Are and you then asking Sophie? me? Yeah, Roseanne. Oh, good Lord. I yeah. was like, but I don't work in the porn industry. <laughs> I'm a different kind of actress. <laughs> no, that's Sophie. <laughs> yeah. No, the question was for Sophie. So in the porn and... No, yes. Good yeah. Lord. 
<laughs> I think that if you agree with me, I think that uh, thank you, Sophie. More, I'll save you. <laughs> save more, me. more and more young people are having uh, more and more truthful conversations. Um, I don't remember 20 years ago, and I mean, I'm 42, I don't remember 20 years ago when I started being exposed to all this, um, us talking about the damaging effect to men's psyches by looking at so many hours of pornography before their first sexual encounter. It does damage psyches. It does have impacts. Mm -hmm. um, we're not talking about, you know, a couple consuming uh, pornography, you know, here and there on a, in a balanced way. That belongs to, you know, what you want to do. But for it to be mainstream and to be violent is a different matter. What's your and sense? We've got to wrap up in just a few moments, but Roseanne, what's your sense? Like, we've seen some of the images mm -hmm. from the past and from the present. Uh, is, the, is the imagery of, of women, the marketing of women, getting any better or is it getting worse? I feel like it is, and I have a wonderful example. Uh, my mentor is present in the audience. Her name is Tantu Cardinal, and she's a, an Indigenous Canadian actress that you might be familiar with, and she tells me, I don't know if you're here, please. She has worked tirelessly longer than I've been alive to change that imagery, not just of Indigenous women, but of women in the medium of film and television. And she took me under her wing, and I would not be here where I am today without her. And she sees that change happening, and she has expressed to me that she's proud of me and the work that we're doing, and that she does see a change, and it is happening. So I stand on the shoulder of giants, the shoulders of giants, and, and I think together women like us will continue to do that work. Like Angelina said before, it's all these little things yes. that we have to keep doing every single day. That's why we have 24 hours in a day. That's why they're broken up like that in little segments. So yes, I, I do. I have so much faith and hope for the industry and for uh, mainstream Hollywood. I really wish we had more time. We do have uh, four fabulous women on stage here today. Um, and I, yeah, I hope, I hope that there is, there continues to be progress, but it's kind of terrifying to see the images that you brought us, uh, Madonna, that... Uh, I, think the, I think that it's, uh, personally, I, s I have a lot of hope for the future. Yeah, I see okay. big changes happening, and that people believe that, 67% of people believe that they are, that companies can change the world more than governments. So mm. I think it's really, you know, when you start looking at brands like Procter & Gamble, making these huge changes, it, uh, it makes a huge difference. Thank you all so much. And thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.